Um, we're no. recording the session, so I just want to welcome everybody. And our uh, session today, of course, is about uh, Yitzchak Rabin. Um, Yitzchak Rabin, who was uh, um, Israel's prime minister, I gotta go over to here. Um, it was the first of the seven prime ministers um, uh, who, who was born in Israel. So all seven of the first prime ministers, they were all during the first 45 years of Israel's founding since 1948, they were all born in the diaspora. Rabin was the first Sabra, therefore, to serve as prime minister. He was born in Jerusalem in March of 1922. So here we've got, of course, as you know, David Ben-Gurion, our Israel's first prime minister from 1953, Moshe Sharet, uh, followed by, then David Ben-Gurion came back and served for another eight, a uh, little more than eight years. Levi Eshkol during the Six Day War, followed by Golda Meir, followed by Rabin. Then Menachem Begin, we talked about last week. Then Yitzhak Shamir and Shimon Peres. They had a rotation, I'll talk about that. And then Yitzhak Shamir won again. Then Yitzhak Rabin. Then Shimon Peres for a short period of time. Uh, then Netanyahu, Ehud Barak, Ariel Sharon, Ehud Omer, and Benjamin Netanyahu until today. So those are Israel's prime ministers <clears throat> throughout uh, the, the, the time uh, uh, and uh, the early years. And as I said, so the first seven were all born in the diaspora, uh, Rabin the first to be born in Israel. Now, just a quick word or two, by the way, just to make sure everybody knows, the prime minister is the head of the government. Israel also had the president who was the head of the state. Rabin's career began, and, and, and the political uh, head of the government is the one who really makes the decisions. Rabin began his career um, uh, in the Palmach. The Palmach is an acronym for Plugot Hamachat, which means the striking force. They were established as part of the Haganam, Israel's defense force, in 1941. And they uh, had three assault companies in northern Galilee, two in Central Galilee, two in Southern Galilee, and one in Jerusalem. They were basically a corps of permanently mobilized volunteers. So their bases were situated, they were situated and, and their bases were on various kibbutzim. The members would be responsible for both agricultural tasks as well as being a fighting force. Those of you who have traveled to Israel with me or perhaps on your own, almost always I take a group, we go to the Pamach Museum in Tel Aviv which tells the dramatic and beautiful story of the young people <coughs> and what they did. Um, they absorbed the values of the kibbutz, which, meant, which eventually became part of IDF and Israel ideology. And that is collective responsibility for the group and the individuals in the group. And also the principle of working for the greater common good. Now, eventually the Hamas became absorbed into the IDF, into the Israel Defense Forces. And among those who rose up, came up in the ranks and were very important uh, in later years as well, names familiar to many of us, uh, as they also entered the political sphere, Yigo Alon, Moshe Dayan, Chaim Barlev, Uzi Narkis, Ezra Weitzman, and Yitzhak Rabin. So one of the things the Pamak did was to launch preemptive strikes into Syrian and Lebanese territory, often sending members who were fluent in Arabic and Arab dress into Syria or Lebanon in order to scout out targets or sometimes to sabotage targets. Now, Rabin's first mission was in 1941 when he went 30 miles into Lebanon by foot with his group and they cut down phone lines in order to prevent the Vichy French from being able to rush reinforcements to the area. This by the way, operation is somewhat uh, well known and famous because it's the operation when Moshe Dayan lost his eye. So British policy, as we've discussed in the previous two discuss, uh, uh, lectures, were, was to prevent the Jews from immigrating to the Yishuv in Palestine. Rabin led operations to free Jews who were arrested, um, who had been locked up and put into detention camps by the British. The most famous operation was one, again, I've often taken some of our congregational groups to a place called Adlit, which is south of Haifa. And it, it looks like a detention camp, almost like a, some people are coming from a concentration camp, almost to be put into another place that looked like a concentration camp, south of Haifa. And these were people that the British were not allowing to come into Israel. And so 
With this um, uh, particular daring raid, 200 were freed and were absorbed into the population. Now, one of the things that, that uh, Rabin was uh, uh, charged with then, um, again, before the uh, declaration of the State of Israel, was when there were 90,000 Jews who were living in Jerusalem, and they were isolated. They were cut off from the, the they, they were isolated, and they were cut off from the rest of uh, the Jews. Excuse me, Rabbi, could you mute everyone? Yeah, sure, please. Sure. Okay, let me mute everyone. Thank you. You're all muted, and you can unmute yourselves as you wish. Okay, thank you. And so what I wanted to show you here was um, uh, that this was what uh, Israel looked like in the 1947 partition plan. We've got here the, um, uh, the orange areas, which were the areas of the Jewish state. And there you see Jerusalem, which had 90,000 people, is cut off. This is all Arab territory here. And so uh, he led, uh, the, 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 the uh, Arabs controlled the hills, were looking down on the long, narrow, windy road. They would shell the, con shell the convoys who were bringing much needed supplies from, from the coast, from Tel Aviv, from Jaffa to Jerusalem. And so Rabin planned the convoys to Jerusalem in 1947 and 1948. He led what was called Operation Nakshon, which was the largest concentration of Haganah forces uh, at that time to capture valid Arab villages so the convoys would be able to get through. Some of you um, may ha be familiar with uh, the uh, 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 um, convoys that were there uh, and uh, have, may have seen some of them. Um, this was the road to Jerusalem and th this was talking about 1947. Take a look at what this was like. Um, and. Uh, the, this narrow, windy road through this hill country. The top areas were controlled by Arab villages. This is, they were very uh, susceptible. They were trying to bring in supplies. And so this was Operation Nachshon that was led by Rabin in order to break through. He was a courageous and fierce fighter and technician. Tactician. His experience in the IDF and as a commander and fighter shaped his outlook, especially during the 48 War of Independence. And he would make frequent reference to his uh, career in the military and the impact that it had on him. Um, and he, during the, uh, 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 he was also commander of what's called the Harel Brigade. When you come up to Jerusalem from Tel Aviv, there's a, a place and it says Harel along the road. Um, again, with groups I've led to Israel, that's a place where we often stop because you see Jerusalem from there. Um, and to declare the, the, the blessing that we say upon entering Jerusalem. And he lost half of his soldiers in that battle. And he said the following, um, quote, as long as I live, I will never forget the rows of bodies riddled by bullets, bodies that had once been of my beloved friends, the brave fighters of the battalion near Kibbutz Kiryat Anavin in 1948. I remember the cars in flames on the road at Bab El Wad, whose drivers gave their lives trying to break the siege of Jerusalem. Now, again, um, there's now a, a, a modern road that goes to, from uh, Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. But uh, uh, those of us who traveled to uh, Israel in the 1970s and even in the 1980s may remember, because it actually was just that narrow road. And along the side of it, there are tanks. And they've still left those there, um, the tanks which are meant to remind everyone of, of the cost uh, at which Jerusalem was eventually uh, uh, brought into Jewish hands in the uh, uh, War of Independence. Now that uh, battle, that, 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 that experience of the War of Independence uh, had an impact upon him because he felt the military was not adequately prepared. Um, and he was determined to make sure that the state of Israel would never again be unprepared to meet aggra aggression. When he became prime minister, he was known as Mr. Security. And he rose through the ranks of the um, IDF uh, holding nearly every operational command in a career that spanned 27 years, culminating in becoming chief of staff of the IDF in 1962. And it was in this position that it helped, he was able to help prepare the country for the Six Day War in 1967. So going back to um, uh, uh, his, just a quick overview of his career here. Um, he was born in 1922, died in 19... Killed in 1995. So in 1964, he was made IDF Chief of Staff. 
After that, uh, he did that until 1968. 68, Golda appointed him as ambassador to the United States from 68 to 73. We'll talk about this uh, in a few moments. June of 74 to 77, he became prime minister. After serving as prime minister in the government of Shamir in Paris from 84 to 90, he was minister of defense. Then in 92, minister serving both as minister of defense and prime minister until his assassination in 1995. One of the things that uh, Rabin established was the IDF training doctrine and emphasized the importance of training. And uh, the, number two, the leadership style, which many of us are familiar with, which is <coughs> captured by the words aharai, which means follow me. Um, and that's one of, of course, the, the distinguishing aspects of the Israeli military. Um, and as chief of staff, of the general staff, he developed the idea of fighting doctrine uh, based on a concept of mo quick movement and surprise. Obviously, key element of IDF tactics in the Six Day War and beyond. In a speech he gave at Hebrew University after the Six Day War, he said, quote, the IDF was, and this is a beautiful uh, statement here, the army of a nation that desired peace, but was capable of fighting valiantly when enemies force it into war. It was an army that displayed all the splendor and virtues of that people whenever it faced difficult trials. It was an army that proved its unrivaled prowess in combat, yet even in the heat of battle, preserved its humanity. Now, as a military man, he saw the importance of Israeli power and military might and prowess as a tool that was to be used as a deterrence. For after the Gulf War in 1991, in a speech he gave to military cadets, he said that, quote, no Arab ruler will seriously consider the peace process as long as he can toy with the idea of achieving more by violence. So again, he was a military man, built up the military, was responsible for many of the things that happened there, um, but he also uh, was devoted to the cause of peace in the sense of that that's what he saw the military, the purpose of the military, was to be able to make Israel strong enough so that the Arab enemies wouldn't be able to achieve violence, that he believed in the importance, by violence, their goal of destroying Israel, and he believed in the importance of deterrence, all the while recognizing the limitations of military force. He realized that the Arab armies, every time they were defeated, would still come back. Uh, they would be able to increase the quantity and quality of their arms after each time that Israel defeated them on the battlefield. He believed, therefore, in the importance of power and the perception of power in the Middle East and understood how significant that was, with, especially in the Middle East and especially with Israel's Arab neighbors, and recognized there could be no peace without security. But he also realized that while the IDF could protect and safeguard Israel and its citizens, Israel would not be able to impose peace or any political solutions or policies on the Arabs that was against their will. Any questions so far, by the way? Okay, please do feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question if you have one at any time. Now, Rabin was not a fan of the settlers or of the settler movement. He saw the territories conquered in the Six Day War as a bargaining chip that could be used to get peace with the Arabs. And until the Six Day War of 1967, France was Israel's primary supplier of military equipment. But Rabin came to realize the importance of the United States. So when he finished his military career as chief of staff um, in 1968, and he was very close to Golda, he asked that his first assignment, his first entry, entree into politics, be as Israel's ambassador to the United States. When he came in 1968, um, it was Nixon won the election. Um, actually, uh, uh, Rabin tilted towards Nixon and for the first time really started to make inroads with the Republicans. This was at a time when most American Jews saw the Democratic Party as their natural home and when in fact the Republican Party was not seen as very favorable towards Israel. They were very much isolationist. They were very much, um, uh, think about the, the policies of Dwight Eisenhower and of John Foster Dulles, who were really promoting uh, the Arab uh, uh, 
perspective. Uh, in the State Department, we've talked about the fact that there was a natural inclination in that direction, and that was much more under the control of, of Republicans uh, at the time who were pulling away, weren't, didn't want to get too close to Israel. Um, so Rabin was trying to reassess part of this, but ultimately the important thing for him was uh, the U.S.-Israel alliance. The close cooperation with the United States, however, meant that Israel needed to be aligned with the United States' interests, which he felt was borne out to be true when during the Yom Kippur War in October of 1973, as some of you may recall, uh, most all of the European nations, including France, with whom, as I said, Israel had once been a close ally, most all of the, all of the European nations refused to allow, is, uh, to allow America to land troops, even in American bases on European soil, to refuel when they were on their way to Israel. The European nations were all worried about Arab retaliation. They were fearful of the cutting off of oil if they were seen as being helpful to Israel. And so they refused to allow America to use American bases to resupply Israel. And that further then actually drove and solidified the alliance between uh, Israel and the United States. Um, and the recognition of the importance of good relations and close cooperation. Well, after the Yom Kippur War, about a year later or so, uh, Golda Meir was really just heartbroken uh, by uh, the loss, by the fact that uh, for so many reasons, you know, she uh, uh, was tempted to have a preemptive strike like they did in 1967. Uh, but she was very worried uh, when they saw the buildup of the troops in, 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 uh, in Egypt and Syria in 1973. But um, at that point, he, 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 she was worried that, you know, Israel would get, uh, 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 you know, be repudiated by so many for taking that initial action. And so he, she waited and it was a call, terrible cost of Israeli lives. Um, and she took that with her um, and, and, and ultimately resigned. Now, after she resigned, the Labor Party was looking for who would be her successor. He was, Rabin by this time was back from uh, uh, serving as ambassador. He ha was a political novice, really had never run for elective office or anything like that, but he had two very attractive assets. One, obviously, was the national defense credentials that I've mentioned and his years um, in, in, in the military, chief of staff during the Six Day War, et cetera. And then the second thing that he now had under his belt was good relations with Washington. Yehuda Avner, in his wonderful book, The Prime Ministers, which we've referred to, writes, quote, Rabin's meteoric, me meteoric rise to the premiership, for which he was thoroughly unprepared, was due to the Labor Party's disarray, still, re still reeling from the near-fatal surprise attack of the Yom Kippur War. So in other words, the Labor Party, you know, had been in power since 1948. Um, they really didn't know which way, uh, uh, who to turn to. Uh, the main contender and the one who really had the clearer path was Shimon Peres. Um, now, Rabin and Peres were bitter rivals. Uh, Rabin really could not stand Peres at all. Um, it goes back, it went back to the 1960s, apparently, when he was in, uh, when, when Rabin was a general in the IDF and Peres was director general of the Ministry of Defense. Uh, there was tremendous distrust between the two. Uh, Rabin beat him uh, uh, for the, in, in the internal Labor Party uh, 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 vote, uh, 298 to 254. So when he became prime minister, um, because of the fact that Perez had such a constituency in the Labor Party, he made Perez his minister of defense. But he never trusted him, never liked him. Um, in, in, there's a couple of stories that are told in the book of the prime ministers about uh, uh, a para, uh, about Rabin just cutting off Perez and just saying, well, stop pontificating. I mean, they really, uh, uh, and, and he just always felt he was two-timing him, double uh, uh, dealing behind his back and things like that. Oh, oh I've got a great story to, to share with you, told to me by Hertzi Makoff. Hertzi is the director of the Begin Center in um, uh, uh, Jerusalem. And uh, he spoke at our synagogue a couple of years ago, about a year ago, about the uh, uh, raid of As on, on Aserik by, uh, uh, during Begin's, uh, 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 when Begin was prime minister. Anyway, Mikhov was Shamir's chief of staff. And there was a period of time uh, when, I'll show it to you again. There was a period of time when, um, uh, when, when Shamir and uh, Perez rotated the premiership. 
So uh, Yitzchak Shamir, 83 to 84, and then Shimon Peres, 84 to 86. During that time, Rabin had already been prime minister. Um, so uh, now he was minister of defense. The three of them had like an inner cabinet, so to speak. They called it the cabinet of the prime ministers because it was Shamir and Peres. Peres, by the way, never won a pri uh, the pr uh, 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 as prime minister ever on his own. Um, when he served, it was because he had this alternate arrangement. It's a little bit like the arrangement that Gantz and Netanyahu have right now. So one starts as prime minister and the other is foreign minister, and then it reverses and so on. And during this time, for both of them, uh, uh, Rabin was a defense minister. Anyway, so the story that Makoff told me was what, during that time period, they would have like an inner club, not club, but an inner cabinet and meetings, the three prime ministers, so to speak, even though only one was really prime minister, and so it was Shamir from Likud, it was Perez and Rabin, both from the Labor Party. And Rabin would always tell uh, Makoff that, uh, and, and Makoff saw it in the dynamics there, that he always felt much more comfortable with Shamir. He trusted Shamir and he agreed with Shamir much more than he would agree with Perez during those little inner meetings and discuss, uh, discussions, and that he trusted Shamir more than he trusted Perez. So it was very interesting. Um, when uh, uh, Rabin was prime minister during uh, that, that uh, first time in 1976 was the raid on Entebbe. Raise your hands if you remember the raid on Entebbe. Yeah, so um, in June 27, 1976, it was an Air France plane that was fl flying from Tel Aviv to Paris that was hijacked during the stopover in Athens. There were 230 passengers on the plane. 83 of them were Israeli, and there were 12 crew members, and there was a selection. You may recall it was the uh, Palestinian terrorists working with the Beider Meinhof gang, and so there were German, uh, a, a, a German woman uh, uh, who was uh, uh, one of the terrorists along with others, with a German accent doing a selection, having the Jews go to one side and the non-Jews who were released. So 90, again, 83 of them were Israeli, and there were another 15 Jews on board, so 98 Jews were detained and flown to Uganda. Uh, actually, all of them were flown there, but, but eventually the other passengers were freed. The crew members stayed with their uh, members of their flight um, uh, uh, who had flown, flown with them. Now, Rabin as prime minister um, was asking for military options and he wasn't getting any. And so as a result, and there were demonstrations outside the prime minister's office, because now we're not talking about a handful of, of, of uh, hostages. There were close to, uh, to 100. Um, and, and begging them to negotiate with the terrorists. Now, although the policy was not to negotiate with terrorists, it really was to negotiate with terrorists. After all, a couple of years earlier, they negotiated and sent back uh, the, uh, uh, a number of Arab terrorists to receive the bodies of several dead Israelis who had fallen in the uh, Yom Kippur War. And so uh, Rabin decided, uh, quietly, you know, with his government uh, permission, uh, that he was going to negotiate with the terrorists. At the time, Menachem Begin was head of the opposition, and Rabin spoke with him, and, and Begin said they would not oppose any decision taken by the government to save the lives of Jews, include even if that meant negotiating with terrorists. So with that, that was very significant, because it meant that uh, Rabin had the confidence then that he wouldn't be, and, and Begin said, and we will state that position publicly could have very easily used it for uh, um, his own purposes, uh, begging or political purposes. One of the things that, by the way, that comes through loud and clear through all of these different things, uh, stories and things like that, is, is what a statesman Menachem Begin was, much more so than I think any of us ever quite realized. One of the reasons why I think this documentary that's coming out within a year or so will be of tremendous interest. So at any rate, um, one of the ideas that was floated, by the way, a Kaka made me one, uh, by the uh, uh, de Defense Department was that what they would do was, because don't forget Idi Amin, they were now in Uganda, uh, headed by Idi Amin, had been trained by the Israeli forces. Israel, of course, as you many of you may recall, had built the airport there. And so they went and they found the plans of the airport. Um, and But somebody uh, in the, but the uh, uh, a chief of staff in the, uh, came up with an idea, the Defense Department, to send Moshe Dayan, who had relations with Idi Amin to Uganda to negotiate and let the hostages be freed. And, and, and he would say that, and, and Rabin flatly rejected that idea, vetoed it right away. He said, then they'll have our most celebrated and recognized general and they'll be able to use him as a pawn and a tool, no way. So we rejected that idea. 
And so negotiations were actually uh, uh, begun with the terrorists. And as a result, um, they are threatened July 1 to execute people, and then they just extended it to July 4th. On Saturday, July 3rd, an unusual Shabbat cabinet meeting where religious ministers walked to the meeting, um, he revealed the top secret military plan to send troops halfway around the world to try and <coughs> extricate the uh, uh, hostages. Begin again was consulted as head of the opposition. He supported the negotiations, and now he indicated his support for the military operation as well. And he said uh, that he would be supportive regardless of the outcome because he recognized the risk that was being taken. The operation was the furthest that had ever been taken from Israeli territory. Um, and uh, flying low across Africa, et cetera, et cetera, as you all know, it was called Operation Thunderbolt. Thunderbolt. Um, when the plane landed, there was a Mercedes uh, with, with a big black guy who was riding around waving and everyone uh, to, 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 uh, to catch the soldiers off guard. They thought Idi Amin was there. And within 30 minutes of landing, uh, the first plane uh, had found the hostages, uh, had said to them, Banu from Israel, saying, we are from Israel, we've come to take you home. And within 30 minutes, the first plane had already been loaded up and was carrying uh, hostages back to Israel. Finally, when, uh, when the final plane had, la had left uh, Uganda territory and had landed in Israel, is when there was, on July 4th, was the tremendous euphoria uh, over the settling of, of uh, uh, over the rescue, daring rescue, which had been unprecedented. Shimon Peres, by the way, originally had opposed the negotiations, and then later he uh, was skeptical about the military operation as well. That was part of the acrimony that I mentioned before between the two of them. And so it was one of uh, Rabin's finest hours. Um, in that first term, uh, he completed the disengagement treaty with Egypt from the Yom Kippur War. So in 1973 was the Yom Kippur War. In 76 is when uh, 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 this, uh, uh, 76 or 77 rather, is when the it was finally negotiated, and that was the shuttle diplomacy of uh, uh, Henry Kissinger going back and forth. Now, during that time, some of us may have forgotten, but things were rocky between the United States and Israel. Um, uh, Secretary of State Rogers, a Ford Secretary of State, called for or threatened a reassessment of U.S. policy and relations with Israel, a reassessment of the entire relationship with Israel, because it, they felt Israel was being a little bit uh, too obstinate about the peace negotiations with uh, the uh, Egyptians. So both countries uh, uh, ultimately signed what was known as the Sinai Accord. Um, and, uh, uh, but again, as I said, it was a rocky time in terms of some of the relations with the uh, Republican administration, uh, but, uh, and with Kissinger and later with Rogers and others. So uh, the outcome of it though was that Egypt and Israel find, uh, uh, declared that the conflict between them and in the Middle East shall not be resolve, resolved by military force, but rather by peaceful means. Now, that was very significant, as you can imagine. And we spoke last week when I taught about Menachem Begin. And by the way, the uh, videos from the previous classes are available on the B'nai Tzedek website as well. Um, so when we spoke about that and the, the dramatic breakthrough of the peace treaty with Egypt, in many respects, it was this negotiations that uh, uh, Rabin handled that helped to make it possible, that helped to make the Camp David Accords of 78 and the peace treaty with uh, Egypt in 79 possible. Um, and so Rabin really deserves credit uh, for helping to make that, pave the way for that. Now in regard to the rocky relations with the United States, then in 1977, there was a meeting between Rabin and Jimmy Carter in Washington. And afterwards, Rabin came back to, the, to Israel and publicly announced US support for the Israeli idea of having defensible borders. Carter was furious and issued a clarification. And there was a famous, in, under Jimmy Carter's president then, a famous fallout. And that was the words used between in the US-Israeli relations. Partially what contributed to his defeat in the, in the in Labor's defeat in the next election. Now, um, when uh, uh, um, Rabin was prime minister, and during this visit that I just mentioned to Washington, his wife took a little side trip. Anybody remember where the little side trip was? It was to a bank. And she was withdrawing money from a bank account 
And at a time when they, they would set up what he was ambassador, and it was at a time when Israel, uh, Israelis were not allowed to have bank accounts in foreign countries. Um, an Israeli reporter saw this and uh, wanted to confirm it. He went back and he made a deposit into the account, uh, so to speak, and it was accepted. That's when it was confirmed. He, he blew the story and uh, she was then tried for uh, violating this law and Rabin stood with her. He was an amazingly honorable and honest guy. Um, and ultimately, he wasn't able to resign because elections had already been called and a sitting prime minister couldn't resign. But he basically um, resigned and he did not stand for re-election. And Shimon Peres uh, became the, the uh, candidate of Labor Party. That's when Labor lost to Shamir. And that's why they had that joint agreement when they had the unity government. And the two of them alternated uh, Shimon Peres <coughs> uh, with Shamir going first, then Peres, and then... Rabin as defense minister during that time. So let's fast forward now to Rabin's second term. Um, <clears throat> and Rabin had formed, when, when Rabin came into power then, he led the first labor-led government in 15 years. Because let's remember that uh, here we had, um, after Menachem Begin was elected in 77, then it was Shamir, then it was Perez in this eclipse term, then Shamir again, and it wasn't until 1992 that Yitzhak Rabin uh, now was able to, to uh, form a, a government and, and then bring labor back into, into uh, a power. Um, and uh, uh, the Rabin uh, uh, um, strategy during that time was for, for and, and, or his perspective for, for, for him and for many Israeli strategists was um, that uh, uh, the PLO and Palestinian terrorism presented and presents a serious, secure, a serious security issue for Israel, but did not see it as posing an existential threat to Israel's existence. The threat to Israel's existence mainly was seen as coming from Arab armies, Arab states, um, and Iran being in that category. And in many respects, that still, I would say, reflects much of the thinking in many strategic areas of Israel today. So Rabin's approach to Israel's challenges was almost always practical. He was a problem solver. When he um, was Minister of Defense during the first Intifada, um, he implemented a policy called the Iron Fist. And he said, we must respond with an Iron Fist. But later, he was troubled by all of that. Um, and, and many describe it. Ross and Makovsky in their book say the following, that the image of the IDF as a powerful army up against Palestinian kids throwing rocks. And by the way, I don't understand why everyone always calls it stones. They're not stones, they're rocks, and there's a big difference between the two. Anyway, as a powerful army up against Palestinian kids throwing rocks and its adverse effect on international public opinion really got to him. Secondly, he was concerned about the impact of fighting the Intifada was having on is the morale of the young men and the young soldiers in Israel's army. And thirdly, he was concerned about Israel's ability to for sustained conflict without any hope of peace, without any uh, hope of resolving the, the, this uh, quagmire, uh, the ability to focus on bigger picture uh, by, uh, uh, of the military and the larger threats if they were preoccupied with these skirmishes. So with all of these little factors here, um, uh, it helped to change Rabin's perspective. Again, still always the quintessential military man. But there was also not just what was happening internally in Israel, but the context of the global situation. And in the 1990s, the United, uh, the, the US, uh, early 1990s, the Soviet Union had declined as a force. And the Soviet Union was no longer really a player in the Middle East. They didn't have Egypt. They could barely get anything together with Syria. Um, also, the United States had defeated Iraq, who was the leader of the primary opposition to Israel um, in the, once, once the peace treaty had been signed with Egypt. And now Iraq had been defeated. So with what was happening on the global stage, as well as these factors, um, he felt that the, the threats to Israel had diminished. He felt the military was strong, that there was an opening, a possibility for reaching accommodation with their neighbors. And so Rabin embarked and sought peace or at least accommodation with the inner circle. The inner circle referring to the enemies in Israel's immediate proximity. 
that's uh, the Palestinians. He felt that this would reduce the risk of what was referred to as the external circle. In other words, the nations like Iran and that were further out. Let me just mention, by the way, that in recent years, uh, the policy of the Netanyahu government has been a bit different and uh, has been to, uh, and, and also part of the Trump plan, has been to try and reach out and, and form alliances with the Arab nations around Israel. The thought always was, well, if we make peace with the Palestinians, the other countries will fall in line. And more recently, as um, people, many of the Arab nations have gotten tired of the Arab-Israeli conflict and the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, many of the um, Sunni Arab countries uh, are tired somewhat of the Palestinian obstinance and refusal to accept any kind of accommodation. And that's why we, we have uh, uh, quiet relations, and that's why you see all kinds of little murmurs, something positive in the Saudi press. Uh, all of a sudden, in the Hebrew uh, 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 play in, in Egypt, that, or a, a movie in, Israel, in Egypt, that uh, uh, is not quite as anti-Semitic as it, as it always is, and things like that. Uh, and of course, other quiet agreements that exist. Um, but for, at this particular time, that was the thinking, to work with the Palestinians. Now, there were secret talks that were undertaken in Oslo in 1993 without Rabin's knowledge. And this was something that Perez had started. So again, once again, that Perez, Rabin, uh, you know, distrust there. Perez at this time was Rabin's foreign secretary. Um, and, and if anyone on the call, uh, in, in the class, by the way, after I, I when I take a, a break in a few moments, would like to share, I, you know, at the end, they referred to each other as friends. And I, 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 I don't know uh, if they ever really became friends, Perez and Rabin, uh, 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 because, but, but they at least publicly made that reference, as you'll see in a, in a, in a, in a few moments when I refer to something. Um, so anyway, uh, Rabin at first wasn't thrilled about it, but then ultimately he authorized their continuation, even as he expressed great skepticism. And they eventually became channel of official dialogue. And then Rabin agreed to the PLO coming in as a party to the talks, uh, being brought from Tunisia in order to uh, a, a, a enter negotiations with Israel, crossing that uh, Rubicon, crossing that red line. Um, and uh, he received a letter of commitment from Yasser Arafat, which specifically stated the PLO's recognition of Israel's right to exist and the renunciation of terrorism. So with that then, uh, Rabin did proceed uh, in the negotiations uh, with uh, Ar Arafat. Um, and as we all know, of course, that recognition is, is kind of, uh, uh, you know, tangible. It, 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 it is not very firm uh, in terms of its right to exist as a Jewish state. And of course, uh, while he said that he renounced terrorism, in the meantime, he ultimately was caught uh, promoting terrorism. But nevertheless, at that particular time uh, with this, uh, we have the... Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, um, agreement that was signed then between the PLO uh, and uh, Israel. And so with that, we have the famous uh, handshake on the White House lawn with uh, President Clinton. Uh, surely uh, uh, all of you may remember this shot and this scene, uh, but perhaps even more important is, is, is how that came about, and that was the one right before it. The last thing in the world that Rabin wanted to do was to shake the hand uh, of, of, of Yasser Arafat, which had blood on it uh, in, in so many ways. Um, and yet, uh, uh, you know, he was kind of coaxed into it and pushed together by, by uh, uh, um, uh, Clinton, as you can see in this uh, photo here. And uh, so this was the after, but this is the before. And, he, and Clinton talks about the fact he really kind of had to pull them both together um, in order for that to, to happen on the White House lawn. Um, so when the treaty with Jordan was signed in the Arava a year later, in October of 1994, and in it, it's, uh, Israel said that it, quote, respects the present role of the Hashemite kingdom of Jordan in the Muslim holy shrines of Jerusalem. And it added that, quote, when negotiations, when the permanent status will take place, Israel will give high priority to the Jordanian historic role in these shrines. And so with this, in 1994, along with Shimon Peres and Yasser Arafat, um, uh, Rabin received the Nobel Prize for Peace. Now, let me stop here and just uh, open up for any comments or questions anyone may have before we talk about what happened after that uh, uh, time. Any, uh, uh, or, by the way, any particular um, uh, personal uh, recollections or insights um, anyone would like to uh, share um, with us. Um, about that uh, 
time. Eric, please, Eric Elnice, you got your hand up. Go ahead, and then Mark Gerber. Hey, uh, question. I have to assume that uh, Rabin's, uh, let's call it at least initial success in a peace process was because of his credentials as the army chief of staff and that sort of thing. It's kind of like like a Nixon going to China, Some it seems to me. That well, he was known maybe, as I called Mr. Security. So you're right, Eric. Right. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so so that was really just my guess, which maybe I think you just confirmed that maybe only he or maybe few other people beyond him could have pulled off something like. By that. By the way, talking about Nixon going to China, it's also Begin going uh, dealing doing the deal with with Egypt as well. Begin had always insisted on territory. Now, one of the things though is that that Rabin was a very strong military man, had great military credentials. He had this deep, uh, gravelly voice that uh, when he would talk, he would sound like this. You know, he sounded like a military guy. Um, so, so the thing is um, that, that that he had all of that. But he also, coming out of the Labor Party, he had also always felt that the land could be dealt away, negotiated for peace, was much less concerned about that uh, than, uh, uh, than, than Begin and, and his party, okay? Um, next, I've got Mark um, Gerber, and then anyone else, please feel free to raise your hands as well so I can see you. Just wave until I recognize you. Go ahead, Mark. I was just going to comment, uh, and I didn't really remember this from the time, but in the book, they talk about how Rabin described, you know, this, his thinking or how he described his reaction to the handshake, that he wasn't shaking hands with Arafat as, you know, the father and grandfather of soldiers, and, uh, but, but that as, you know, the leader of a nation and, and kind of with that responsibility. And I just thought that was kind of interesting and, and extremely well, well put. Thank you. Uh, someone had, 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 had uh, um, mentioned... Uh, again, I think it was one of his uh, uh, chief aides, that when he was traveling to one of his last meetings with Arafat, he was just like so not into it and so not looking forward to it that he really, you know, he, he felt he was such a grimy, slimy kind of a guy. You know, uh, um, I, I, I think he offered him his razor. I'm just kidding. Uh, but uh, <laughs> Arafat always had that, that three-day growth. Um, by the way, I, 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 uh, my family, I met uh, President Clinton uh, shortly after uh, uh, he came down from the uh, Camp David uh, talks between Ahu, Ehud Barak and Yasser Arafat. Um, and uh, Ezra actually asked Clinton two questions. He asked him, first of all, um, uh, whether or not Arafat always wore the military fatigues, which was a great question because it was all the pictures always done with that. And second of all, he asked him how it was that Arafat always had a three-day growth of his beard. So President Clinton <laughs> laughed. That was pretty funny. Um, but at any rate, so, so the thing about... Uh, 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 Rabin is is that uh, um, you know he, he was doing this kind of be, well well because he felt it was the right thing to do. Um, I mean, one of the things that, that he said in, in one of his speeches uh, uh, a, after uh, um, you know time and time again was this responsibility he felt for the soldiers. And I, I quoted from one of those speeches earlier. There were a number of times when he spoke very much like that um, in, in that kind of a way of, of responsibility he felt both for Israel and the long-term picture and everything, but also as a military man because of the soldier's command who had died. Um, so when he um, had won the uh, uh, Nobel pr uh, pr uh, Prize, um, he, he, the uh, Oslo Accords uh, created a Palestinian authority, which was tasked with limited self-governance of parts of the West Bank and of the Gaza Strip. It acknowledged the PLO as Israel's partner in permanent ne status negotiations about remaining questions. And now those questions were still important, which were not, well, well they haven't been resolved to date. Uh, the borders of Israel and Palestine, uh, the Israeli settlements, uh, the status of Jerusalem, uh, Israel's military presence in and control over remaining territories after the recognition of the Palestinian Authority, and the Palestinian right of return. All of those were yet to be negotiated. Now, that's what was taking place with what was called Oslo II, or the peace process. And so in his uh, last speech before the Knesset, which was in October of 1994, he was assassinated a year later, he laid out his ultimate vision of where he saw his negotiation with the Palestinians leading. And he wrote, and he said the following, quote, first and foremost, a united Jerusalem as the capital of Israel under Israeli sovereignty. And one of the things is, in other words, he never foresaw uh, the giving up any of Jerusalem uh, territory. Number two, he also spoke in this speech at the Knesset about Israel retaining the settlement blocks, modeling them on Gush Katif in the Gaza Strip. Again, 
giving up certain areas, but where the settlements exist, which is part of what's being discussed right now and considered, um, including part of the Gaza Strip. He said, quote, uh, the borders of the state of Israel during the permanent solution will be beyond the lines which existed during the Six-Day War. In other words, he wasn't talking about the going back to that. We will not, he specifically said, we'll re, we will not return to June 4, 1967 lines. In regard to the Jordan Valley, he said, quote, the security border of the state of Israel will be located in the Jordan Valley in the broadest meaning of that term. So part of what we have here then is what was Rabin really advocating? Now, the reason I mentioned this is because today, you know, many years after the death of, of Rabin, some 25 years after his assassination, you know, he is held up as being the patron saint in certain respects of the um, left and of the peace uh, group because of all that he did. And also people on the right, however, say, well, wait a minute. The reality is that had he lived, we're not so sure he really would have gone further because look at this last speech that he gave at the Knesset. So it's very, very interesting how people will, you know, view uh, what he had, uh, what he did, and what he would have done. Now, as we all know, in uh, November of 1995, November 4th, there was a tremendous uh, peace rally, in part because there was great division in Israel right now about the Oslo Accords and what was happening. Um, incidentally, there was, you know, there, there were all kinds of terrible negative imageries of him, uh, someone putting him in a Nazi uniform and things like that. Um, and and I, I will say this, by the way, and that is that, that he uh, uh, also participated in much of the rancorous debate. Um, he had very, very uh, vicious words uh, for the settlers and, and considered them and spoke about them in extremely derogatory terms. So it was being hurled back and forth on both sides. With that, um, there was this big peace rally to try and show that there was <clears throat> Uh, the Israeli public was behind the uh, things that Rabin wanted to do. Um, it was in, held, held in what's called Kikar Malachim, the King's Square in Tel Aviv. Um, and the demonstrators who were there, some maybe 100,000 or so, or, or um, uh, between 100 and 400,000, I forgot what the number was, expressed their support for the agreements and for Rabin's leadership. But as we all know, uh, that unfortunately was not come to, to come to be because he was assassinated uh, right after giving uh, his speech. Um, and what I wanted to uh, uh, say was um, the Oslo Accords, um, which were, were uh, agreed upon, were very controversial. Controversial because of the fact of what they led to. Um, a, a historian, Ephraim Karsh, wrote uh, the following about uh, the, the agreements. Quote, it was the strat darkest strategic blunder in Israel's history creating the conditions for the bloodiest and most destructive confrontation between Israelis and Palestinians since 1948 and radicalizing a new generation of Palestinians, living under the rule of the Palestinian National Authority and Hamas with its vile anti-Jewish, anti-Israel incitement, unparalleled in scope and intensity since Nazi Germany. All in all, more than 1,600 Jew Israelis have been murdered another 9,000 wounded since the signing of the Declaration of Principles, nearly four times the average death toll of the preceding 26 years. So the Oslo process actually ended then after the failure of the Camp David summit with Ehud uh, uh, Barak, uh, and then with, subsequently with Ehud Omer in 2000, and the outbreak of the Second Intifada. So uh, Rabin really believed though in, in, in the possibility, and let me share with you what he said in his uh, final, in, in that speech that he gave at the rally, and I quote part of it. Um, he's standing on the uh, 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 podium there and he says, permit me to say that I am deeply moved. I wish to thank each and every one of you who've come here today to take a stand against violence and for peace. This government, which I am privileged to lead, together with my friend Shimon Peres, decided to give peace a chance, a peace that will solve most of Israel's problems. I was a military man for 27 years. I fought so long as there was no chance for peace. I believe that there is now a chance for peace, a great chance, and we must take advantage of it for the sake of those standing here and for those who are not here. I've always believed that the majority of the people want peace and are ready to take risks for peace. In coming here today, you demonstrate together with many others who did not come that the people truly desire peace and oppose violence. Violence erodes the basis of Israeli democracy. It must be condemned and isolated. 
this is not the way of the state of Israel. In a democracy, there can be differences, but the final decision will be taken in democratic elections, as in the 1992 elections, which gave us the mandate to do what we are doing and to continue on this course. But more than anything, in the more than three years of this government's existence, the Israeli people has proven that it is possible to make peace, that peace opens the door to a better economy and society. Peace is not just a prayer. It is first of all, for, peace is first of all in our prayers, but is also the aspiration of the Jewish people, a genuine aspiration for peace. Your enemies of peace were trying to hurt us in order to torpedo the peace process. I want to say bluntly that we have found a partner for peace among the Palestinians as well. The PLO, which was an enemy and has ceased to engage in terrorism. Without partners for peace, there could be no peace. We will demand that they do their part for peace, just as we will do our part. This is a course which is fraught with difficulties and pain. For Israel, there's no path without pain, but the path of peace is preferable to the path of war. I say this to you as one who was a military man, someone who is today Minister of Defense and who sees the pain of the families of the IDF soldiers. For them, for our children, in my case, for our grandchildren, I want this government to exhaust every opening, every possibility to promote and achieve a comprehensive peace, even with Syria. <coughs> this rally must send a message to the Israeli people, to the Jewish people around the world, to the many people in the Arab world, and indeed to the entire world, that the Israeli people want peace, and support peace. For this, I thank you. <coughs> As I read that out loud to you, I can't believe how many times the word peace appears in that speech. It's like almost in every single sentence there. And the song, of course, that was sung, and uh, the words to which I believe he had in his, in his pocket when he was shot, and it had the blood stain. You can see it in the Rabin Center, by the way, in, in Tel Aviv, which is a fantastic museum, are the, are, are the, are, is the song for peace, Shir Le Shalom. And so uh, um, one of the uh, 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 last things I'll say, and then again, open it up for questions and comments, is that um, uh, uh, when, uh, when Rabin no longer was prime minister, um, and uh, uh, had, had completed his term as prime minister. One of the things that uh, uh, he, he did was he had his, his secretary, the guy who wrote the book of the prime minister, Yehuda, uh, out there, uh, uh, and, and he told him, you must now go and work for Menachem Begin. And he said to him, well, how can I do that um, when, when you know, he, I, I've been with you for 10 years and he's in the opposition? And he said, because you serve not me, but you serve the state of Israel. And so it is that, that he was always very, very honorable, honorable individual, uh, as I said, very honest and trustworthy in so many respects. Um, and so uh, with that, uh, that, that just kind of gives us a little sense of the kind of, of person uh, that, that he was. Um, and so I'm going to open up for any uh, questions that anyone may have um, at this time. Uh, Rabbi, I've always uh, been very unsettled that he was assassinated by a Jewish Israeli. And I wondered if there were any other repercussions, whether there was um, firing of any um, police officers or, or other people in, involved in planning this event. So, so to answer that um, uh, qu question, uh, uh, you know, there were all kinds of investigations that, that were uh, uh, done about the uh, assassination um, because did they know or anything like that? And, and, right. and uh, um, I, I think it's kind of inc inconclusive, the different, you know, conspiracy theories and stuff like that. Um, in fact, actually, uh, uh, some, many of you uh, may, may well have, have been uh, to the, uh, um, oh, I, I just took it down, I'm sorry, the, the site of where uh, he had uh, uh, been assassinated. Um, and, and so, yeah. Um, other comments or questions anybody may have. Uh, God, Eric Elman, I see you. Uh, so, so let me just say, it was Yiga Amir uh, who did assassinate him uh, from the right wing and, and, and far right wing religious uh, uh, extremists uh, who felt that uh, uh, Rabin, and the reason he did was, was he felt Rabin was on a path uh, to, that would not lead to, uh, uh, that was just you know, terrible for disastrous for the state of Israel. Um, and uh, Yiga Amir still sits in prison to this very day. So, um, yeah, but it was terrible, and, and, and they, the security around him was somewhat lax. So that's part of when some people say, well, gee, was there anything else to it? Eric, Elman, go ahead. And then anyone uh, else I want to show the, uh, raise their hand, please. Wait I guess a, com 
I guess a comment and a question. The comment is it's, uh, it's fascinating and sad to think that uh, those were his very last words before he was killed. You know, all of this about peace and reconciliation and working together and then, and then that was all over. So that was my comment. Uh, my question is, you had mentioned Rabbi several times about the significant clashes that he had had over the years with Perez, right? Yeah. Were those clashes over personality? Was it policy? What were, what were those disagreements? A, a lot, a lot of it had to do with personality, and that was that, that Rabin didn't. You know, I, I've described how honorable he was. Shimon Peres was always viewed as being a, a very sleazy kind of guy who uh, would not necessarily uh, be be very trustworthy um, by others as well. Um, that's why you know he, he never won an election in Israel. Uh, the one time when he actually before he became president, at the end of the, his career, he was beloved by leaders around the world and everything. But before that time, um, uh, he was running for. Uh, 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 president of Israel, and there were only 120 voters, and everyone thought he would get it, um, and he did. That's when Ephraim Katsir was was uh, elected instead, um, and so uh, it had a lot to do with the nature of his character, and there were policy differences as well, but some of those policy differences were if, if Ravine would say one thing, Paris would say the other, and and I really um, have to, to look up because I'm, I'm uh, uh, maybe I'll, I'll try and come back next week and let you guys know. Um, did they ever, you know, were they ever really Friends, you heard him say, "I'm here with my friend Shimon Peres." You know, was he just saying that, or did, or, 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 or did he really mean it? Um, I don't know. Good, Stan Beter. I see you got your hand up. Um, I'm sorry, the phone is ringing. <laughs> yeah. I Go apologize. It'll, it'll stop ringing in a second. I, I think the last speech that uh, Rabin made just okay. now, I hadn't before, but it reminded me a lot about Lincoln's second inaugural. Uh -huh. talking, but we're not enemies, we're friends, put down weapons, yeah. you know, and listen to our better angels. Sure, sure. And, and I think it was very much that kind of a, of a, of a speech there. Any other uh, comments or questions? Because I want to actually close um, with uh, uh, the, 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 the Song of Peace, which I had uh, 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 mentioned um, and, and, and had just uh, shared with you. Um, let me see if I can... So this was the Song of Peace.
So you get the idea. That's uh wait, let me have to stop sharing this. So there you have it, the uh, song for peace, Shiru Shir La Shalom, sing a song of peace. And that was uh, has become a rallying cry in so many ways. Um, and uh, the uh, 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 both the peace movement as well as you know capturing uh, that that was the the last words he he spoke were that speech, but the last words he would have proclaimed would have been in this song, Shiru La Shalom. So any other comments or questions before we wrap things up? Uh, Natalie, were you raising your hand or just moving? No, okay, all right, Stan, go ahead, last, last. Uh, um, I just wanted to say, not a question, but a comment. What strikes me about all the prime ministers we've, we've studied so far, especially Yitzhak Rabin, but all of them, is that they had tremendous um, uh, courage of all kinds, military and political courage and strength of character, and they didn't hesitate to do what was right, even if it was not politically expedient. And the other thing is, uh, they all of them recognized that uh, one way or the other, in order to maintain the Zionist dream of a Jewish democratic state, one way or the other, the Jews had to be separated from the Palestinians. In fact, I read in the book that when Rabin was still negotiating for the Oslo Accords and everything else, he also was telling his closest inner circle that if this doesn't work out, we still have to physically separate because we, Israel cannot go on so, just yeah, let me just, let me, so I let me, hope that next time we, you know, as we conclude next time with uh, Sharon, that we can sort of spend a little time talking about what the vision was of these prime ministers and how that translates into going forward for Israel. So one of the things, uh, one of the things I want to mention specifically is that, that for, for Rabin, as well as for Sharon, it wasn't necessarily a question of peace with the Palestinians. It was really much more separation. Separation. And, right. and we'll see right. that in the next uh, session as well. So with that, I want to sign off um, and uh, just to tell everyone.